Before we bring out Senator Hutchison, Senator Nelson would like to offer a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Senator Bill Nelson. Kay and I are going to have a discussion, uh, but uh, we wanted to give you a glimpse through video of not only what has happened uh, and some very important times in the history that we're going to recount tonight, uh, particularly uh, President Johnson's influence as senator, vice president, and as president on shaping the space program, that influence still felt today. Uh, so we're going to show you two videos. And on the first video, uh, it'll be my voice over. And these are very short. This is less than two minute videos. Uh, but I want to give you the setting. Uh, the setting is the 60th anniversary to the day of President Kennedy going to Rice University with Lyndon Johnson sitting right behind him. After the Soviets had surprised us with Sputnik and then surprised us again with the first human to orbit the Earth before we could even get Alan Shepard up in suborbit, uh, Kennedy made a bold decision. Now, Johnson had prepared a lot of the ground because as majority leader, he had uh, really shaped the future by passing in 1958 the NASA uh, bill that set up NASA. And of course, uh, Johnson was quite concerned what the Soviets were doing. He was all over that. But it took Kennedy to make that clarion call that we are going to the moon and return safely before the end of the decade. He did that after Alan Shepard had flown. We were way behind. The Soviets had the high ground. And... Kennedy made this decision before we ever put John Glenn into orbit. And this was in the spring of 1961, after Gargarin had flown. By the way, I'll tell you a secret that is now no longer secret, but it was a secret because the Soviets kept it a secret. A successful space flight was to orbit and then to land but the Soviets were afraid we were going to beat them. They went ahead and launched a Herculean effort, Gargarin into one orbit, but he didn't land. He bailed out. But they kept that a secret. Uh, a few months later, they put German Titov into 10 orbits. And likewise, they still couldn't land. Uh, and it was later on that they got the ability where they would have retro rockets as the spacecraft was coming down in a parachute. Uh, and then the retro rockets would ignite and, and soften the landing, uh, a procedure that they still use to this day. So Kennedy makes the bold declaration, we've only gone in the low Earth orbit touching it and coming down without going into orbit with Alan Shepard. And he makes this decision. He goes in front of a, a joint session of Congress and uh, he makes the declaration. And it gets some attention, but it doesn't really resonate. It doesn't resonate until the following spring, 1962, when John Glenn shimmies into that little spacecraft on top of the Atlas rocket, knowing that there was a 20% chance that that rocket was going to blow up. And, of course, the rest is history. And America went nuts. 
And so Kennedy makes the decision to again issue this clarion call. He goes to Rice University Stadium in September of 62. And he makes this bold declaration. We go to the moon and do other things, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And that became a mantra of our space program. And of course, as we, Kay and I discussed tonight, we'll talk about how it was Johnson that not only a senator that started all of this, but then as vice president, I'll tell you some of the sneaky things he did, <laughs> taking, uh, taking a lot of the activity away from Cape Canaveral. As Senator George Smathers of Florida said, I turned around and half of it was already taken by Lyndon. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, as president, where he pushed it. And before he left office, fortunately, he was able to see us orbit the moon, not land, on Apollo 8 at Christmas 1968, just before he retired as president. So I want you to have a flavor of that beginning, and then I want you to see a, a two-minute clip on where we're going in 2024. Throughout America's story, there are defining days. Days when minds change, hearts fill, and imaginations soar. Days when visions transform the trajectory of the American story, which is our story. Doing what is hard and achieving what is great that is what stirs humankind. That's what unites us. With inspiration and innovation, no Herculean effort is too large. No moonshot is beyond our reach. And liftoff of Artemis One. A new generation, the Artemis generation, stands ready. Ready to return humanity to the moon and then to take us further than ever before to Mars. Let us continue the quest to unfold this universe. And let us continue to find unity in our discovery. So together, let us continue to dream the impossible dream that now becomes real. Then let us traverse the untouched terrain of the once unreachable stars. It's a new day in space exploration. As we sail on this new cosmic sea, there's so much to learn. There's so much to be excited about. American companies will soon land payloads on the moon for the first time. These missions are really challenging and risky. They're gonna help us conduct new science. Artemis is different from anything humanity has ever embarked on before. And we will discover life-saving, earth-changing science and technology along the way. We're delving deep into what science can be achieved by humans working together with robotic capabilities and future infrastructure to support a long-term human presence at the moon. The main purpose of the International Space Station is to perform science. The fact that we'll have two companies able to provide the opportunity to reach low Earth orbit, but it'll change the way we look at how we fly to space. 
And the more we learn about the Earth and the more we understand the processes that affect it, the better we can plan for the future. The needle nose jet, the X-59, it will revolutionize the aviation industry. We will show what is possible when we dare to reach distant cosmic shores. And we are in total solar eclipse, wow. and this is absolutely breathtaking. Onward and upward. Welcome. I want to add a couple of things for our Texas audience, and I'm so happy that all of you are here, um, to just do the amendment to what Bill said about the Kennedy speech at Rice University. Because what he said in full was, why do we want to send men into space? Why does Rice play Texas? <laughs> Not because it is easy, because it is hard. That was the quote, which we all know. <laughs> so um, I, I want to say before we start that Bill and I are soul brothers. When he was the senator from Florida, and I was, of course, the senator from Texas, um, we just bonded over NASA. And there were a lot of people that said, you know, it's time for us to just stop the shuttles, end the shuttles, and really we ought to go full private and just end NASA. That's really where we were. And Bill and I felt that the, it was important to have the private sector for the investment and the creativity. But we knew that the basis had to be NASA. It had to be the people who had built the, the first space stations and the people who knew that background to work with the private sector and that that would be the best result. And that was the, the result was the NASA Reform Act that uh, Bill and I co-sponsored and passed. And I think that now that Bill was appointed uh, administrator, that was a perfect choice. And I know that um, you called me, I was in Brussels, and you called me and you said, uh, the president has called me himself and said, you have to do this. And of course, it was probably your dream, I would say. What I would turned say? him down. <laughs> well, <laughs> so how did we end up where we are? <laughs> because I started talking about with Grace, my wife, and came to the obvious conclusion, who was I to say no to the president under these circumstances? And uh, so here we are. Well, and uh, you had brought out uh, LBJ's role in this. and. It was really uh, in the history that I have read uh, about the LBJ role, it was really after, of course, Sputnik landed. I mean, LBJ said, by God, I mean, now this is really big. We can't let Russia have a technology edge. And, and he, his quote was, who controls the world is who controls space. He said that. And while he was in the background, because of course, President Kennedy was the president, he also wrote the memo to the president, which is in the archives, that said, I, he was the chairman of the NASA Advisory Council, and um, he had all of the studies done. And then he wrote a memo to President Kennedy and said, we can do this by the end of this decade. And that was then when Kennedy said, OK, I'm going to make the speech. We're going to do it. And the real space enthusiast was Johnson. Kennedy realized the strategic goal of we could not let the Soviets 
master the high ground. Uh, and he looked at it as a space race. By the way, not unlike we've got another space race today. We've got a space race with China. Now, we should be landing on the moon before them, uh, but uh, they've got a very aggressive program in their budget. They've got a lot of room to grow. And of course, we're dealing with budgets in, uh, in a very tumultuous time that the Congress cannot even pass an appropriations bill for this existing fiscal year. And, uh, and, and, but Kennedy understood that America needed a, a higher calling, a purpose. And uh, that's when he came upon it. It's interesting, as Johnson then was, what you said, the chairman of the, they created the National Space Council, uh, an arm of the White House, but he was not a Johnny come lately. He had done all these things back in the 50s when he was the majority leader, the master of the Senate, pointed himself chairman of a newly created committee on space. And the result of that was the NASA bill that set up NASA. And, uh, and then uh, as he became president, he implemented it. But interestingly, he always gave Kennedy credit for having had that vision of going to the moon by the end of the decade and return safely. And you know, interestingly, also in the history, um, that was correct. And when the, the, it was a neutral decision that as we were building then on what Kennedy and Johnson started, that we needed to have a separate place where the uh, astronauts would be trained, where they would build the whole system to go into space. And for all of the different factors, the Houston uh, area was chosen, Clear Lake. And, um, and Johnson died before that got started. And it was Lloyd Benson who then introduced the bill to name it Johnson Space Center. It was actually dedicated while he was still alive, but it was called the Manned Space Flight right. Center. And then you're telling me what I didn't know, that uh, Senator Benson is the one that named it. Changed the name. Changed the name. That's right. And, and, and appropriately Johnson was so. already dead. Mm -hmm. Appropriately so. Yes, right, because he knew everything that Johnson had done yeah. in the Senate, because they had been serving together all those years. So. Um, I'm so glad that we can talk about that here because that, that history wasn't really known. I want to talk about one other thing in history that you and I uh, did, and that was when we were working on uh, the end of the shuttle systems, and there was, uh, we were at the end, but there was what was called an alternate in case we had lost one that was still available. And Dr. Sam Ting came to Bill and myself and the committee and said, I have to have the alpha magnetic spectrometer. He was, he was a Nobel Prize winner in physics, Dr. Ting, at MIT. And he said, this is the genesis of the study of dark matter that I want to make. And so we have to have the extra shuttle to take up the alpha magnetic spectrometer, which was a huge capturing of all the, the dark matter pings that were out of the space station. And so Bill and I, you can tell this story uh, as well, said we're going to do this. And we jointly uh, went to NASA and said, we have to have the extra shuttle. And there was a lot of hesitance because no one really thought the shuttles would still be safe. It, they were aging, all of that. But you were really the one that, that talked them into that. 
talk well, about I, that. I want to brag on uh, Kay a little bit. Uh, no, no, you really did this. You did. <laughs> You see what's wrong today? They can't get along. <laughs> Two of us got along. <laughs> Kay would be chairman and then I'd be chairman, depending on whose party was in the majority. And uh, so uh, first that landmark bill that she had uh, mentioned in 2010, set NASA on the direction that it's on now. And coming into the first year of the Obama administration, it was chaos. They didn't know, they, they were way over budget and way behind time on going back to the moon on a program called Ares. And it was canceled outright by the Obama administration. And so how to go. And so what we did was to try to create a dual track for the future of NASA. There would be the government track, which would still be and is today, the space launch system, that monster rocket that you saw on the, uh, on the screen that was Artemis One on its test flight, no crew, testing out all of the systems and the hardware. Uh, that crew, by the way, we just announced yesterday there was going to be another delay. There's a crew of four that we have named, three F-18 pilots and an engineer. Uh, the crew looks like America, and it's also a Canadian F-18 pilot. And, and so we go back to the moon now after a half century we're going back in a different way and to a different place. We're not going to the equator of the moon. We're going to the South Pole where we think there's water. Unfortunately, also two days ago, fortunately, a new rocket that is absolutely critical that we have in our stable of rockets, a brand new rocket called the Vulcan, it was perfect. But the spacecraft, the Peregrine commercial lander had a valve problem, and it's lost. But within uh, another couple of weeks, another commercial lander will launch atop a SpaceX Falcon Heavy, and if it lands successfully at the South Pole, it is the precursor to a number of these commercial landers that will act as scouts for us then when we send humans to the South Pole. Why the South Pole? Because we think that there's water there. We know there's ice in the crevices of the permanently shadowed rocks. And if there's water, then there's hydrogen and oxygen and we've got rocket fuel. We could have a gas station on the South Pole of the Moon. Now, mind you, landing on the South Pole is not like landing on the equator where you got constant light. The South Pole, if this is the moon and this is the bottom of the moon, the South Pole, and the, the sunlight is coming in at this angle. So there are permanently shadowed areas. There are, it's pockmarked with a lot of craters and so you've got to be very precise on your landing. So in a couple of weeks, we will have this next one from a Houston company, private commercial company. It's going to launch, and we'll see if it can successfully land. And that will be one of many more to come. I'm saying all this about commercial because as we go back to the moon, we don't go just as the U.S. government, NASA. We go with our commercial partners as well. And the other big difference, we go back to the moon after a half century, we go with our international partners. And boy, oh boy, are they beating on us. They want to be on that flight going. And so we're doing a little horse trading with them to get them to pay for stuff, to save us money. Uh, and then we'll give you a flight opportunity for an astronaut. Okay, I want to talk international, but first, I want to just ask the basic question. 
why are we going back to the moon? What is the big picture? Because we don't know enough now to go all the way to Mars. We can't do it uh, and have the safety that we want. The moon is three or four days away. Mars is seven, eight, nine months away, depending on where the planets are. And so we're going back to the moon to learn to live, work, develop, invent in that hostile environment in order to be able to go to Mars. And uh, that's why we're going back to the moon. So what can you learn from the development of living on the moon that you think will apply to Mars? How much do we know that is capable in Mars to, to know what we do on the moon is helpful? A number of things. Uh, just a couple that I'll give you an example. Uh, we're going to learn how to build things on the moon. We're going to use moon dust called regolith. And we're going to apply some magic uh, formula to it and make concrete. And we're going to create a, a landing pad so that you don't stir up all that dust when you're landing. Uh, we're going to build structures on the moon. We're going to learn how to protect our uh, astronauts from a solar explosion with all that radiation through space. As so long as we're in low Earth orbit, we're within, generally, uh, we are within the magnetic sphere of the Earth, which protects us from the radiation on a solar flare. Get outside of uh, Earth, and you don't have that protection. And we've got to learn how to do that if we're going to send uh, astronauts going all the way to Mars and beyond. And the other thing that uh, we're going to do, we can't really do a mission to Mars and guarantee that we're going to have astronauts coming back now. Because you can't send astronauts for eight months, get there, then you can't stay on the surface for just a short period of time. The planets have been realigned. You've got to stay on the surface a year or two in order to bring them back with that short period of time. So we've got to develop new propulsion that will get us to Mars faster. And we're working on that on nuclear thermal and nuclear electric propulsion. You know, one thing again for uh, this group here is that one of the members of our NASA Advisory Council, which Bill has appointed, is an expert in hydrogen propulsion, and he is the uh, Ernest Cockrell Chair in the Department of Engineering of the University of Texas. And uh, he, J, Dr. J.P. J. Clark, so remember that name because he is a real star here at UT and um, is the chair of one of the committees on the Advisory Council on getting there faster, exactly as you have said. That's the priority. I want to brag on you some more. Um, so. By the way, I invited Dr. Clark to come tonight, but he's out of town. I was, he was really sorry to miss you. There is on the International Space Station, now this is a fully personed platform. Usually there are at least seven astronauts uh, they are international astronauts. There's always Russian astronauts that are on the International Space Station because uh, there's a whole segment of the space station that is Russian, and the Russians built the space station with us. Uh, so there are various U.S. components, and one of the U.S. components is a national laboratory. She's the one. Kay did it. Uh, it's a national laboratory. It's just like our laboratories at Santa Fe, Albuquerque, uh, out in California, up in New York. These, these 
national treasures. They're doing the research. They are finally getting to the point of having some breakthroughs in particularly protein crystal growth, which by the way, was my very crude experiment 38 years ago on the space shuttle. And it's finally getting to the point where it's paying off, particularly in cancer research with Keytruda and stem cell research. Uh, so K is the one that insisted on the NASA bill at some point uh, that it was going to be a designated national lab. That's where most of the science is being conducted on the International Space Station. It's really exciting because uh, the cancer research is very different in space from here. And you can only see certain growths of cancer cells in space that you can't see in our gravity. And so really with our MD Anderson and the, the private companies that wanted to have this ability to be in space, we got the idea going uh, of having a national lab so that the companies could participate again with uh, funding, but also uh, having the designation of the national lab. Uh, that allowed for some of these experiments that they really couldn't do in the microgravity um, conditions on Earth. So um, I'm glad to hear uh, some of the results. And, and speaking of results, Dr. Ting's result uh, from the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, he said it is groundbreaking in the dark matter potential source of energy. And, um, you know, <laughs> I went to the Johnson Space Center with him once, just a few years ago, and uh, you know I'm looking at this big screen that's really just a big screen with little lights kind of out there, black screen, little lights, and he he acted like he was in church. I mean, he was so excited looking at all these little things and trying to tell me how important this was. And I'm going, you know, whatever you say, I know that's going to be right. But it was really fun to see his excitement. <laughs> uh, and interestingly, uh, just to show you how all of this comes together, we've got up there a million miles from Earth, the James Webb Space Telescope. Oh, this God. is in a position that it's always on the opposite side of the Earth from the sun, and it's always looking out into the dark of space. And therefore, 365 days, as the Earth goes around the sun, it will scan all of the heavens. We are learning so much as this telescope in the infrared spectrum looks back even as far in time as to about 300 million years after the very beginning. And the very beginning, named by a NASA scientist who got the Nobel Prize, is 13.8 billion years. So now think about this. The telescope is capturing light that has been traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, and that light has been traveling for 13 and a half billion years. That's a long distance. <laughs> and it's, it's opened so many understandings that we did not have of the universe. I'm bringing this up to tie it back in to dark matter. With the telescope, we are learning about dark matter as well, along with Dr. Ting's uh, instrument that is attached to the International Space Station. And uh, sooner or later, they're going to figure it out. Well, uh, Dr. Ting came to the uh, Texas Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine and made a presentation. Uh, probably, we're, we have a 20th anniversary of the, the Texas Academy. And he came about maybe 10 years ago, and he said the most important thing about this kind of research is not what you get that you were looking for. It's all the things you get that you weren't looking for. And, and he named some of the, like the 
the use of the MRIs. I mean, the MRIs was an offshoot of where, what the original purpose of going into space was. And so all of this medical uh, research and productivity is the offshoot. It wasn't the purpose. And, um, and he made a great talk to our members of our Texas Academy, which are all members of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And um, it, it, he was just a wonderful advocate for the things we're doing. But I want to go back, I want you to go back to what the, it was astounding about that the telescope that finally got out there and saw this. What else has come out of that? I mean, is it have there been other civilizations that have come and gone? What what do we know so far? Well, one of our purposes is to look for life. Now, it's not true that I have discovered an alien civilization in the Amazon rainforest. <laughs> However, when you think about how big the universe is and how many stars or suns there are out there, not just billions in our galaxy, which is the Milky Way galaxy, but there are billions of galaxies with billions of stars each. And so one of the things with the telescope, followed up first by the Hubble Space Telescope, which is orbiting the Earth. James Webb is out there in a fixed, neutrally buoyant point a million miles away. Uh, is the fact that we're discovering other planets that are revolving around other suns or stars. Uh, they call them exoplanets. Uh, with the James Webb Telescope, we just discovered uh, on a star that's something like 250 light years away, a gaseous exoplanet. It's not going to be too long that they're going to find an exoplanet that is not too close to the sun, the star, not too far, just right, that probably is tilted on an axis and revolves, and oh, by the way, that they can sniff, they can find these chemical elements, carbon and water. You get that, you've got the elements for life. So that's one of the ways that we're looking for life. That's why we're digging on Mars right now. We've got 40 titanium tubes about the size of a cigar filled with cores that we've drilled with that rover up there, which by the way has a scout the little helicopter that flies on Mars. It's flying, by the way. We didn't know if we could do this. This was just to see if we could do it in a 1% atmosphere. We have 100% atmosphere on Earth. It's a 1% atmosphere, and they designed a helicopter and blades that is now flown over 60 times. And it has become a scout for the rover as it goes, checks out something. So these 40 tubes are up there. We're trying to figure out within the budget constraints how to get them back. That's another part of looking for life. Another example, looking for life. So we snuck up next to an asteroid. And it had an arm of the spacecraft came out and it had a gas pressure hit it that sucked up a bunch of the stuff. And all of that was put in a capsule, and miraculously, you saw it land on the Utah desert. It landed conveniently about 10 yards from the side of a road. Uh, and they now have it at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Interestingly, two bolts they couldn't get open. All the material, they had all this extra material that 
was far in excess that we were looking for today on the outside. Well, yesterday, they got the two bolts off. And this was a complicated procedure because they didn't want to contaminate Destroy, yeah. the stuff inside. Yeah. And so now we've got this plethora of material that, again, we are examining. You remember also the asteroid, uh, asteroid that uh, we wanted to demonstrate if we found a killer asteroid that's coming for us, like the movie Don't Look Up, uh, Armageddon, whatever. Well, we sent a spacecraft after it. We intercepted it at its closest place to Earth, which was seven million miles away. This is a couple of years ago. We hit it at 14,000 miles an hour, and we wanted to see if we could move it. And then with our telescopes, we confirmed that we not only moved it, we changed its trajectory. So now we know if we find something that we're afraid is going to hit us, hopefully to avoid the fate of the dinosaurs, which were hit by an asteroid that was six miles in diameter, uh, then maybe we might have a chance to save us uh, if we could get it far enough away and know that it's coming, and then we could get a spacecraft there and ram it. So these are all the things. These are just some of the things that are going on. I haven't talked about what we're doing about climate. All those instruments up there, they're measuring what is happening to the Earth. So, for example, we put up a, a, an instrument uh, that is measuring the elevation of fresh water for the first time. We, we could measure the elevation of the oceans. But now, lakes, rivers, streams, reservoirs, we can do that from space. We are just putting up with the Indians a instrument that is going to help us understanding what is the shifting that's going on on the Earth's surface, the land, the ice, all of this going into a compendium of information to give us a 3D comprehensive understanding of what is happening to our Earth so that we can be better stewards of the Earth and its climate and save our Earth. You said that you were doing that we're doing this with India, and you've just announced that Qatar is going to make uh, an orbiting uh, mini space station uh, in partnership. Uh, one of the key things that this administrator has done is really focus on making international partners uh, for several reasons. He, he mentioned money, uh, contributions, uh, but also it, it's a soft power. It's uh, bringing in partners that work with us uh, in very uh, important ways that make them then allies, that we set up trusts uh, with each other, we do then more experiments, more research together. And I want you to talk about that because um, one of the things that Bill has asked me to do on the NASA Advisory Council um, is to work on the international uh, things that we can do together. And we went uh, together uh, in last summer to Argentina and Colombia. And what made me think about this is uh, I want you to talk about that focus of yours. It's one of your priority items. But also, it, it is helping these other countries once we have the capabilities to have satellites that can look at the water, uh, the land. Uh, we're helping countries, for instance, in South America put satellites up that can look at the Amazon, and it'll start helping farmers know when to plant, when to harvest, uh, because you'll have that information if, it, if the 
soil is right for planting or wait two weeks. So talk about that. Why did you pick that as one of your priorities? And I know you've traveled a lot uh, to other countries besides South America, which I'm so supportive uh, of doing, but you've been all over the world making partners, and you mentioned India, uh, Qatar. Talk about that. Well, Kay was with us on that trip, which we have not had uh, members of the NASA Advisory Council go. And uh, she not only was a great addition, but she was a unique addition because when we're sitting with a left-leaning president in Colombia, President Petro, and he's very blasé coming in. Uh, he has a totally different style that you would think of a president. And we thought maybe we'll have 15, 20 minutes. Well, we were in there for two hours. He was absolutely riveted when we got into this stuff. We also had our four-star commander of the U.S. Southern Command on that particular visit. Uh, and it's amazing how General Laura Richardson and Senator Hutchinson added to that visit after I talked to him about the, all the, the things up, up yeah. in uh, the instruments that we have, how we can help him since he's trying to save the rainforest in the upper Amazon region, which is in southern Colombia. Uh, we did the same thing with President Lula in uh, Brazil, who normally will not see anybody unless it's another head of state, but he'd see NASA. And he spent an hour and a half with us. So here's General Richardson, who starts talking to him about some of the joint military to military activity that we've always had with Colombia, and of which then Kay and I and General Richardson went with the Colombian Air Force they were so proud to show off their new satellite uh, command center. Uh, and then Kay is there as the former ambassador to NATO to start telling about NATO and Colombia is a non-member but affiliate member of NATO. And of course NATO's in the news because of what's going on over in Ukraine in Russia. And so it, it was just, it was the stars had all aligned at the same time. And what it did was it reinforced to this president, it was the previous president of Colombia that asked to become a partner, an official partner of NATO, and it's the only South American country that is. Uh, and it was a, it's a very different party of the present president. And we were reinforcing, along with General Richardson, the importance of their staying in the partnership uh, because now Argentina is also looking at that, as is Brazil. And that would be a value added for America to have, uh, and Canada is very supportive of this as well, to have more partners of NATO in South America where we can start working with their militaries to uh, train and do joint exercises to show uh, the importance of uh, a military that is positive and uh, honest and well-trained and can do joint activities. And so they will become more uh, with us. And uh, because we were in Argentina, uh, the Amer American ambassador asked us to talk about NATO, and we did. And now with the new president of Argentina, it's going to be uh, something that will be put on the table. It's not at all a done deal, but that could be a real beginning of security for America because China is all over South America. They are in infrastructure. They're... Uh, very active in Argentina and Colombia, as we uh, noticed, also Brazil. And so planting our flag uh, was very, very important. 
And I think that uh, what you're doing is going to other countries in South America with showing how the satellites and, and partnering on the satellites uh, can be helpful uh, in the rural areas. But you've also been to other countries, like you're making yeah. a partnership uh, in One of in the Europe. rural areas, remember, uh, the last stop that we had was in Cali, Colombia. Mm -hmm. and. We have a we NASA have a joint project with USAID, and it is basically to help poor farmers be able to get better production from their land by giving them the information that we get from our satellites. For example, we can tell them what their moisture content of their soil is. We can predict droughts. Uh, we can tell them these things so that they'll know whether or not they need to go ahead and irrigate. Uh, this information is unbelievable and is now available to you real time on either nasa.gov and then on that website, look at the Earth Information Center or you can go to earth.gov and you can get the same information and more. It's really amazing. Okay, uh, there's, I know we're going to be running short on time, but the other major area I think we need to talk about is security and the technology, the satellites, uh, and something that I didn't realize until I really started getting back into it is one of the big problems with space debris. Um, you know, we've had to adjust the space station because uh, of space debris. You're doing something very, very important with the Artemis Accords. Talk about that to try to bring people into, you, what you're trying to do that I see is you're trying to bring partners in uh, so that we share and we have more in the more global leadership, but with, with so many other countries, but also uh, you are trying to, to help everyone in this new paradigm of space uh, be responsible partners. And at NATO, uh, we declared space as a domain of war meaning that we now are uh, going to be looking at the capabilities of, you know, we have satellite guided missile systems already, but now we need to know where China is, Russia is, and uh, I think it's important that what you're doing on let's all be good neighbors in space um, and report when we put satellites up, report when we're going to dismantle them, make sure that we don't put, blow them up. Talk about that. NASA brings people together. NASA brings about unity. Certainly in the spirit of Lyndon Johnson, as one of his famous speeches, uh, he even uh, said, as the, as the good book says, come, let us reason together. So domestically, NASA brings people together. R's and D's both support our civilian space program. They're a little hard-headed when it comes to the budget, but that's a side matter because they can't get it together because of other issues. Internationally, that's true as well, and that's what Kay is talking about. Uh, NASA is a way that uh, people can come together in unity. Look, we're in the middle of a war, basically, with Russia over Ukraine. Not up there. We built the space station together with the Russians. Uh, we flew, they had the first space station, it was called Mir. And they invited us to bring our space shuttle and dock. Uh, and then we built this space station together. We're still together. 
the astronauts and the cosmonauts, they're very professional and they don't miss a, a beat. And is there always one of each on yes. the shuttles? Yes, and that's also why we also, we send integrated crews up. We always have an American astronaut going up on the Soyuz, and we always have a Russian cosmonaut that's going up on the SpaceX Dragon, which is the commercial spacecraft that is delivering crew for us to the International Space Station. So NASA brings people together, and that's what we've been doing a lot of this traveling uh, trying to utilize that, and it's actually become a, a tool of U.S. foreign policy, our soft power. Uh, and so... Tell you, us about the Artemis Accords. Okay, and how the many Accords people... basically are a common sense set of principles that follow up on the Space Treaty. By the way, that's another Lyndon Johnson that was somewhere around 1967 when he was president. And he oversaw the passage of the Space Treaty. Uh, it was ratified by the Senate, and it is a declaration of the peaceful uses of space. The Artemis Accords, named after Artemis, the twin sister of Apollo, which is the name of the program that is taking us back to the moon and on to Mars. Uh, so the Artemis Accords are a declaration of common sense principles of the peaceful uses of space. And thus far we have about 33 countries that have signed, signed it and there will be a lot more. Mm -hmm. I've, we're out of time and I want to end by giving you a book that Everyone here knows I'm an orange and white bleeder. And one of our past chancellors of the University of Texas system was Hans Mark. He was a deputy administrator of NASA. He was. One he, smart guy. Oh, he was awesome. He was so interesting. And he talked about all, he talked about in this book that Hans Mark wrote, the Space Station, A Personal Journey, and he talks about a lot of the inside things that went on that is the history of our NASA efforts and his role in it. He became Secretary of the Air Force after he left NASA. I mean, he, he was at Ames and then NASA and then Secretary of the Air Force, and he was so interesting and loved UT. He, he stayed in Austin until he passed away. And he gave me this book in 1987 because, you know, I was just uh, active for, that was before I even went to the Senate. But this needs to be in your library, in the NASA library. Was 1987 when you were a cheerleader at UT? No. <laughs> A little bit after that, <laughs> I must say. But this needs to be in your library, so I'm giving it Thank to you, you Kay. today. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. This is the end of the program, and thank you for coming and giving us all of these insights. Thanks, thank guys. You. Appreciate it.